Amen and amen. I love that song. How are you guys doing this morning? That, that was terrible. How are you guys doing this morning? I know it was just Christmas and everyone's really sad, but you know. <laughs> hey, I just want to say it's, it's my privilege to be here this morning. My name is David Piper and I'm the youth pastor here at DCC. So we're going to have a good time. That's just what I'm going to kick off with. So yeah, just uh, Merry, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, all that good stuff. There seem to be so many holidays and events that I can't even keep track of where I am. But about three months ago or so, Tim asked me if I would preach on this Sunday, today, and I went, ooh. I knew there was Christmas House. Uh, I knew there was the North Olympic Foster Parents Association meeting and, and all of that. I also knew there was Squinter Jam. And so I had a very frank discussion with God. And I was like, God, okay, what are we doing? Because Tim said, you know, he was like, you get to preach on whatever you want. And I don't know about you, but I felt the weight of that. I was like, I could preach on Noah's Ark. I could preach Daniel in the lion's den. I was like, what am I going to bring to these people, Lord? And so I had this conversation with God, and he put it just so clearly on my heart in a very timely fashion, to which I'm very grateful for, um, that it, we would be speaking about grace this morning. So this morning I get to bring to you God's grace, and I've actually, over the last few years, have become exponentially more aware of God's grace in my life. I don't know if you all can say the same, but in the last two years, I have just seen God's grace on my life just expand, and it's only increased my joy. And so I really just want to share some of that with you. So maybe there's been a time in your life where you have felt the grace of God just so clearly. I don't know if you've been in one of those moments, maybe the, the birth of a child or a grandchild. Um, maybe a beautiful sunset or a relationship that just came out of nowhere and you're just like, this is amazing. And you just feel, and you see just God just working in and through all of that. On the flip side, maybe you experienced tremendous forgiveness after screwing up in a really big way. Like how many of us, like, you know, someone's like, I forgive you. And you're like, thank you. And you just feel this huge relief and this grace that you just feel just like washing over you. And you just feel God working in and through all of that. And so today we're going to look at four aspects of God's grace. Four. The first being an awareness of sin as God's grace. A lot of us don't think about being more aware of our sin as a grace, but it is. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. Everyday blessings as God's grace. Salvation as God's grace. And also what C.S. Lewis calls, he's a great theologian and writer, wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, calls severe grace. And we're going to talk about that as well. So it's my prayer this morning that you would all leave a little bit more aware of every aspect of God's grace. Not Maybe not every aspect I'm going to cover this morning because it's too magnificent. But these four aspects, I just pray they would increase your knowledge and therefore increase your joy in what God is doing in your everyday life. Would you pray with me? Father, you are so good to us. Lord, just thank you for this opportunity to, to share some of my shortcomings and some of the experiences that you have given me, Lord. Lord, thank you for everyone who is who's coming here this morning. It's no mistake that they are here today. God, I just pray that you would open our hearts to hear your truths, Lord, and that maybe if we haven't encountered and experienced your grace, saving grace that you would just illuminate hearts today through your Holy Spirit. Remind us of old truths. Challenge us with new ones, Lord. And I just pray that we would not leave this building the way that we entered. And so, Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would be with me and my weaknesses and everything, Lord. And I just pray you use every element of this service to your glory, God. And we just commit our time to you. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. So, this summer, I actually had the most amazing opportunity. It was this wonderful experience where I came face to face with how terrible of a person I am. It was, it was beautiful. And so I was at IBC, and uh, I was out there, and a man about my age began to talk to me about, uh, about another man my age doing my job as a youth pastor and doing all these incredible things in this town across the way. And I was like, oh, wow. I was like, and in a very Christian way, I, uh, I began to unpack all the wonderful things that I was doing. You know what's so funny? 
is envy is this really terrible thing. Envy is this really funny thing that you and I, we don't tend to be envious of people that we would consider superstars. Like, I don't wake up in the morning and go, because I don't have the knowledge and intellect of a Tim Keller, I am a failure. Like, I don't, I don't do that. We don't do that. Like, I just want to bring it maybe down to a level that we all understand. Like, um, how many of you remember high school? How many of you remember high school? S- some of us, for some of us, it was a long time ago. But in high school, when you're a freshman, you, you enter into school as a freshman, and you're like, you're looking at all the sports teams and everything, and you see a bunch of varsity, like, like, or like seniors, like, joining the varsity basketball team, you go, yeah. That seems about right. That guy has facial hair. Of course, he's like four years more superior than I am as a freshman. And you don't go, okay, well, I'm going to trip out. Why is that senior in there? And I'm a freshman. I should be on the varsity team. And we don't tend to do that. You and I don't tend to be envious of those who are a little bit further along than you. But where envy enters the picture is when you see a fellow freshman joining that team, going places where you think you should be and doing things that you think you should deserve with your life skills and your, all of that at that time, you begin to go, hey, hey, what about me? And so, like I said earlier, like I began to unpack to this man like all the incredible things I was doing in a very Christian way. Like, very, very Christian. Like, I have learned the art of, of, you know, just being like, oh, just dropping in and sounding just right to where he was like, oh, wow, this David Piper's a really good dude. And he didn't even notice what I was doing. And I was like, wow. At the end of that, that whole exchange, I actually walked away and went, what in the world just happened? What in the world just happened? Like, I don't go around, like, trying to have every other person validate who I am as a person, like, in my experience. I'm not looking for everyone's, like, validation. But what came out of my heart in that moment was so toxic and so black and disgusting, I actually went home and I was like, God, what in the world? Where did that come from? I've never even seen that type of disgustingness just pour out of my heart. But the funny thing about that moment was it had always been there. I just hadn't been aware of it. It had always been there. I just hadn't been aware of it. And I just want to be honest with all of us this morning that you and I are far more wicked than we could even imagine. Can I get an amen to that? (laughs) Amen. You, You and I are far worse people than we can even comprehend. And God loves us still. Like, maybe the right situation just hasn't presented itself where someone comes up to you and says, hey, look at this person about your age with your experience and your family background and all this, doing incredible things. Maybe you haven't experienced that yet. Maybe the the darkness in your heart hasn't leaked out onto the world. And praise God for that. But it's coming. (laughs) It's coming. And one day you will come face to face with how wicked and twisted you really are. And you'll be like, I didn't know that was there. And the crazy thing about that is that you're still experiencing good things today. You and I are still experiencing good things today. We just took a breath. Our cars that we drove started, or most of them, or some of us may have got a ride this morning, but we got here. We're still experiencing good things. And you know what's even crazier about that is even people that do not love Jesus and have not submitted their lives to Jesus are still experiencing good things. I mean, like, how does that even work? It's it's not fair. You know, even people that hate Jesus still get good things in their lives. And so I want to introduce you to our first theological term this morning. If my clicker would go. Yes. Common grace. So Matthew 5.45 says he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and unrighteous. So even those who aren't in a relationship with Christ can still experience good things. And we see this every day. And it's what theologians call common grace. Common grace are things like food and drink, sex, love, iPhones, rain, family, friends, not Android phones. You hear it? I didn't, I left that one out, but (laughs) iPhones. Those are things that everyone, that, that believers and unbelievers alike can experience. These are common to all of us. They are common to each and every person, regardless of our relationship status with Jesus. And God didn't have to allow any of those things, but out of his love for his children and his creation, he allows those of us who are wicked sinners to experience good things in our lives. His children are those who, are, who, who, are those who have submitted their lives 
to Christ, he's not just the, their savior, but he's also their Lord and boss. And those are the children of God, but God allows blessings to extend beyond his children. The Bible says that God uses common grace, and sometimes it's removal to get the attention of those who are actually in a loving relationship with him and are not yet in a loving relationship with him. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But if you all have your Bibles, we're going to go to John chapter 1, verses 16. Then things are going to get wild. Totally wild. Here we go. And from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. What this verse is saying is something that I feel is conflicted in, in many Christians' minds, that the law, in fact, is and was a good thing. A lot of us think, to go, oh, the law, that's terrible. You know, but John actually here in verse 16 and 17 labels it a great grace. For the first time, no longer were people like left up to themselves to figure out what pleased God and what broke his heart. All of a sudden, they knew what pleased God and what broke his heart. And this was a tremendous grace. We weren't left out there to figure out, like, oh, is it going to strike me down? Is today the day when I do that one thing that I didn't know I wasn't supposed to do? And I didn't have to wonder that anymore. I don't, I don't know if people did, but they didn't have to wonder anymore. Here's the thing, though. Knowing what God desires and the ability to be able to do that are two separate things are very two separate things. Just over two years ago today, I was laying inside of a giant machine that showed to myself and the world the cancer that was in my brain. Now, this machine was able to show what was there, but could do nothing for me to remove it. It kind of, in a sense, just left me there on my own in, in that machine, cold and, and alone. You know, it couldn't remove it. So did that make that machine completely useless? The answer is no. Without that machine, without knowing what truth is, without, without knowing what God loved and what, what broke his heart, like we would have no idea. And so that machine, which pointed to the, like the darkness and the, the brokenness in my head, you know, like the cancer, showed me the cancer wasn't a completely useless machine, even though it wasn't able to remove it. Now, the law actually put people face to face for the first time with the own, their own darkness inside their hearts. They're like, it was like, this is what God desires. This is all these things is what God desires. And here's you on the other side, unable to do each and every one of these things that God desires. It doesn't give you the ability to do what God desires. It just shows you where you went wrong. And so Paul says this of what I'm going to call the spiritual MRI or the law. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. Just because the MRI can't remove the cancer doesn't make it useless. And just because the law revealed your sin but didn't remove it from your heart doesn't make it irrelevant. It was God's grace to give the law through Moses. But this grace anticipated and even necessitated a greater grace coming, Jesus. A little over a year ago, I was driving my wife's car um, in Port Angeles, and it was, we were just getting ready for the inaugural Squinter Jam, uh, which is a fun combination of squim, winter, and jam, um, <laughs> all in one. And I was actually traveling with a rapper from Phoenix. He was in the back seat. And I was also had a, a DJ from LA also in the back seat as, as well. You know, it was a pretty typical day for me. And um, we were just getting out of the restaurant. And I had looked out, and I looked out to the right. We were just, I'm parked, uh, it's called Parallel Parked. And I'm looking to pull out um, into the traffic when I see a squad car just pass on by, just, you know, going to wherever it was he was going. And I went, okay, well, I will follow every law now that I am aware of and just hope for the best here. And so it takes off, and I, I wait, and I see a, a gap in the, in the space in the traffic. I'm able to pull out, and I pull out into the road, and I set that bad boy at 35, you know, the cruise control, because I'm like, I'm going to follow all the laws of the road here. And the squad car was some 15 lengths ahead of me, 15 cars above me. I'm just driving, yakking away with my buddies from all over the, the country. And we're having a great time following the laws of the road. 
And then I begin to observe this squad car that's some 15 lengths ahead of me begin to drop back in traffic to where, oh, now he's parallel with me and I'm kind of looking over and all of a sudden drops back and behind and the lights go on and I'm looking down at the speed limit. I'm doing 35 and it's 35. I was like, what in the world just happened? It's like, oh my gosh. And long story short, I, ex I like learned that night that I had expired tabs. <laughs> Hooray, I, I, I just, I found out that I had expired tabs. Now the thing is, is oftentimes the government has stopped mailing out those reminders to you all that you have expired tabs. And so this is for free, but if you go out this morning and you check your license plate and you have an expired tabs, don't just say thank you Piper, but also write a check for $15 to the, like, the high school ministry, the give, give to the youth ministry, you know? If, if you benefited this morning, not just on a spiritual level, but a legal one, please give us your money. There we go. So there, there's a little plug. So, because that's a $150 ticket, and I just saved you a lot of money. So there you go. Um, a few months later, after that, that moment where I received that ticket from the police officer, um, I nervously stood in front of the judge, like hoping to explain my case and just say, hey, I, I strive to pay all my bills on time. When they come in the mail, I, I say yes and okay, and I, I, you know, I pay for them. I don't try to actively avoid the law and all of these things. And I, I, I was just like prepared to share all of this with him, to which he just kind of like waved me off, you know? And he was like, no, I'm a judge. I don't know. And, and I, I went, okay. And uh, he, he just asked me a simple question. He's, he said, did you get new ones? And I was like, yes, sir, I did. And he was like, case dismissed. And I was like, huh. Ah. I was just like, I left that courtroom just feeling like a million dollars that day. And I just saved some money and my insurance didn't go up and it was awesome. <laughs> I, I love it. So maybe that you guys can have that experience, but not by checking your tabs. Anyways. After, after this, this moment, it actually kind of exposed myself to like three deep truths. You know, I didn't, you know, sometimes, you know, when you look at things, you're like, oh, that word pretty much means that word, doesn't it? It's, it's all one and the same. But actually, I became aware of three deep truths. And I want to go over them with you this morning. It's justice, mercy, and grace. Justice is getting what you deserve. I was driving through, through Port Angeles. Port Angeles with expired tabs, and I got what I deserved. I literally got what I deserved. So even if you're not consciously, like, doing things on purpose, you could still be breaking the law, even if you could be conscious or unconscious of it. But still, justice says that you're going to get what you deserve for whatever it is that you did or didn't do, even without being aware of it. I rightly deserve punishment. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. The judge knew that I had broken the law, but withheld deserved punishment that, a, that after I had proved that I, David Piper, had made the situation right. After I could show that, he said, nope, this ticket is gone. You know, this ticket is gone. Mercy will save you 150 bucks. Mercy is awesome. But thirdly, even more incredible than mercy is grace. Grace is getting something you don't deserve. Let's say I went that day in front of the judge after having expired tabs, and I stand in front of him just saying, you know what, I, I see there's a fine. I completely don't have the $150 to, to pay for these tabs right now. I can't do it. I, I'm sorry. So that judge would just be like, okay, no problem. See you later, you know? Would that, would that be a good judge? No, that would be a very bad judge. That, that's, that's called distorting justice and not, not enacting justice. So that judge, if he was a good judge, couldn't just be like, yeah, that's cool, David Piper. I've had expired tabs too, you know, come hang out. You know? No, that would make a very bad judge. And he would say something like, because I'm a good judge, it would ruin my good reputation if I let you walk out of the courtroom today without paying the fine, not getting what you deserve or anything. Justice needs to be made right today. Things need to be made right. And since you can't do that for yourself, David Piper, for you today, I'm going to pay your tabs. That would be grace. And grace is outrageous. Could you imagine the headlines? Port Angeles. It would be like front page, you know, judge pay pays like balding 31-year-old's tabs. <laughs> that would be outrageous. People would flock from all over. You know, and maybe they, they'd received, like, justice, and they got, they got that ticket. Their prayer would be, oh, just give me that judge. 
Give me that judge that paid that balding guy's tabs. I want that judge. People would seek out that judge. That would be outrageous, and that is grace. Grace is getting something you don't deserve, and that's outrageous. It's outrageous. Let's look at these three again from a biblical perspective. Justice. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you could be actively doing something, you could be inactively doing something, but it all gets boiled down to sin. Now, all of us, if you have rejected an infinite God, you are worthy of infinite punishment that would lead to your death, but you don't actually have to be committing sins to actually be worthy of that judgment. And like a lot of us in here, I think, it's this very American thing that says like, you know what, I'm a good person. You know, we kind of, we kind of feel that. We're like, I'm a good person. I've, I've never murdered anyone or, or stolen anything significant. I, myself, am a good person. Like, I, I feel this. And I just want to say, excellent. I'm happy for you. Thank you for not killing people and stealing significant things. My father-in-law actually said this hilarious thing to me. He said, jokingly, his, his two goals in life are to never murder someone and to, two, never send a text message. And so far, so good. And so he's like, I'm a good person. No, he's, he's awesome. On the flip side of this, we hardly think about things that we're not doing that we should be doing as sins. Like God actually commands us as Christians, the, the laws that are still binding, are for us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. And we're also called to make disciples of all nations. And I just say, church, how are we doing with that? These are things that God has called us to. How are we doing with that? When was the last time we even said hello to our neighbors? Set aside, shared the gospel with them, shared with them hope. You don't have to actively be sinning to be in sin, and it's only a crooked judge that would overlook righteous justice. Mercy. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Ephesians 2, 4 says, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we are dead in transgressions. God made a way for us when we were hopelessly lost. You did everything, you and I did everything we could have possibly done to deserve getting destroyed. And James chapter 2 verse 13 says that mercy triumphs over justice. I'm so thankful for mercy. Thank you, Lord. But even more than this, grace. Grace is getting something you don't deserve. Ephesians 2.8 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. Grace is outrageous. Grace is getting your tabs paid by a judge. Grace is, is a crazy gift, and it's so good. Give us grace, Lord. Don't give us justice. Don't give us what we deserve. We were like, I want what I deserve. You don't want what you deserve. You don't want what you deserve. In Jesus Christ, we see the justice of mercy and grace of God. Jesus is the embodiment of that grace over the previous grace that God had given Moses. He was like, here's what breaks my heart and here's what gives me joy. Do these things. Jesus comes and says, you know what? I know you can't do that, but I'm going to make a way for you to do that. Hebrews says this, Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all of God's house, testifying to what would be said by God in the future. So Moses presented a lot of people that pointed them to the impossibility of their situation and to the future that necessitated and anticipated Jesus' arrival and the, the future that he would embody and it's one thing to say, here, here is your sin, and here is what you're doing. Look at this, and this is where you're falling short. It's another thing to say, I forgive you. How could Jesus do this? How could God do this? When, when actually, like even today, being a Christian pastor, I still have terrible, wicked, evil thoughts that get exposed every now and again and make me go, Bleh. like, how is this possible? One of the most beautiful moments of grace I've witnessed recently actually happened at Squim High School. No, nobody laughed there. That's, that's great. 
You all must have had like incredible high school experiences. I'm happy for you. That's wonderful. But I, I actually saw the most beautiful, you know, statement of grace happening at Squim High School. It was Reaper Week. This was a week where students are selected at random to play the part of victims of drunk driving. And these, these victims, characterized by this person here, would walk the, silently walk the campus, and they weren't able to talk to their, their classmates or their teachers or any of these things, which might be convenient for some students that didn't want to talk to them to begin with, those teachers. Um, they were actually removed from their families. They slept at the Boys and Girls Club. And for this whole week, it was kind of like they didn't exist. They didn't exist. Their parents to go along with this, this unfolding drama were actually served like fake warrants or like fake uh, notices of death. Like your child has died. Your child was hit and killed by a drunk driver. Your, your child was in the car with a drunk driver. Child is dead. And these families were presented with some tremendously terrible news. This year in particular, they actually brought in a drunk driver uh, along with the families that, you know, the students, they had the students share their perspective of what it was like to not exist anymore. And they also had their parents come in and share what it was like to lose a child. And they had a person who was actually a drunk driver, real drunk driver that killed real people. And she shared her story and she was just begging the students not to drive drunk. And there was not a dry eye in that room. People were getting so choked up. And as she sat down, uh, the MC got up and got up on stage and said, you know what? My sister was killed by a drunk driver just like you. My sister was killed by a drunk driver just like you. And you know what? I've, I've never met that person. I've, I've never seen them since. But if I did, I would just tell them that I forgive them. That I forgive them for the hurt and pain they caused myself and my family. I forgive them. You know, you can present another person's case on their behalf. You can present another person's case on their behalf, but only someone who's truly been in a person's shoes, who has lost everything, can fully represent that and represent them. And there was probably that day no one else in that room who could have represented that level of grace to that woman by saying, you know what, I wish I could find that person to forgive them. And I would forgive them, and I want to forgive you. There was no one else that could fully embody that or represent that. And I talked to her after the fact, after the assembly, and I, I just was just talking about it. I was like, how was that to experience forgiveness from that, from that guy who had lost and had been in the shoes that, of the, the people, of the, the families that you caused so much harm to? And she just said it was incredible. And she was just so overwhelmed by, by the grace that she experienced in that, in that moment. So... Give me grace. <laughs> you can't represent what you lack. You cannot represent what you lack. In the greatest act of grace, Jesus came down representing God to man and man to God. Only Jesus could offer the forgiveness of sins, being fully man and fully God, to die in your place, dying the death that you and I deserve for the wickedness in our hearts as our personal representative before a good and righteous judge. Only Jesus could offer that kind of forgiveness, representing both sides to both sides. How incredible is that? Jesus represented God to man and man to God at the same time in this legal case. And this, that's why it allows Jesus to say things like this. Luke 7, 48, Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who could even forgive sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. You can't represent what you lack. You might be able to pre present something, but you can't embody it. Only Jesus, as fully God and fully man, could extend this mercy and grace to you and I, this woman, and you saying, hey, I'm sure the family of the, the people that you just killed would forgive you if they could, you know, doesn't carry the same weight as someone saying, you know what, I have lost, I have experienced that kind of loss, and I forgive you. It just carries a different weight to it. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. To accept the forgiveness of God 
is to accept the forgiveness that only God can give through the acceptance of his son. To accept that forgiveness is to accept the restored relationship that comes from being with him, the salvation of our souls. Whereas common grace is available to all of us, saving grace through faith is only available specifically to the, the believer after they have repented. And it doesn't matter if you're a good person or not, like you haven't sent a text message or murdered anyone. Some years ago, I was driving to Port Angeles for a meeting, and I was late. Has anyone been, been there? Yes, yes, okay. I was, I was driving to a, a meeting, and I was, I was running a little bit behind. Like, I knew I could get there if everything lined up. And so I was praying to God. I was like, Lord, please give me green lights. All green lights today, Lord. Please, just give me the green lights. And I, I've prayed that prayer many a time. How many of you have prayed that prayer? Like, uh, okay. We're, we're in a safe place. So we've, we've prayed that as well. So on this day, the green lights continued one after another until I reached my destination. And I was on time. And I just thanked God in the process the whole way through. I was just like, thank you, Jesus. The whole another green light. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank All the way there. And then I showed up on time and people were like, wow, this guy's really on to it. Yeah, wow. And I was just like, thank you, Lord. And so what began to dawn on me as I process this whole thing is, you know what, I always, you know, like when things are going well, it's pretty easy to be like, thank you, God. You know, thank you for that green light. But if I actually believe that God was actively, like actively working in those green lights, what else must be true? You guys can shout this out. I work with youth. What else must be true if I'm to praise God through the green lights? You praise him through the red ones as well. And that just like my head kind of was like starting to explode a little bit there. I was just like, are you kidding me? Like, if, if I believe that God's working and active and sovereign over all things, when, in the green lights as well as the red lights, that I need to praise him in whatever, whatever situation that I find myself in. One of my big problems, I have lots of problems, but one of my big problems is when, when I hear, you know, people celebrating the, the prosperity gospel, or you're like, oh, your best life today, you know, all, all this stuff, you know, is that when non-believers see people that, like, have nice cars and have nice houses and nice families and situations and go on incredible vacations, they don't go, wow, I can't believe they're so happy. That's, that's amazing. Like, how could they be so happy? No, people don't do that. No, they go, yeah, of course they're happy. Of course they're stoked. Look at the cars they drive. Look at the houses they own. Look at all the vacations they take. It makes total sense that they're happy. They're having nothing but green light moments in their whole life. Their life is way better than mine. There's no surprises there. I can't ride with that. But when you see a person legitimately celebrating what other people would consider a red light in life, something like a, a financial shortcoming or maybe a debilitating disease or a disability, um, and you're going, you know what, God, I'm going to trust you through this. This really sucks, but I'm going to trust you. I'm going to hold on to you because there's nothing else to hold on to. When you do that, people go, that's crazy. They're like, that's, that's nuts. That's, that, that person is a little bit crazy, but I wish I could have a little bit of what they're on. You know, if, if only for a second they're like, man, I don't have that kind of hope. I want that in my life. And so I'm not saying that any one of these things are good things on their own, like brain cancer is never fun, uh, diseases are terrible, but that God can actually work tremendous good through a person that's saying, you know what, my hope is off-world. My hope is not in the circumstances. Circumstances, they go from green to red, and then red to green, just like that. And if my, if my joy is circumstantial, it will be circumstantial joy. You know, it's not going to be there. And when you can actually say, God, I'm going to praise you through all of this, people go, wow, that's crazy. Everything in our American existence is trying to minimize pain and maximize pleasure as quickly as possible. As quickly as possible. It's why we have duct tape and microwaves. Like, I've seen this. <laughs> Unbelievable. We're trying to get out of that hard situation as fast as possible. They're like, oh, there's no food in the house. Oh, three minutes. Oh, thank you. It's a close one. Or, you know, something breaks, and you're like, I just throw some duct tape on it. No big deal. <laughs> that red light moment in your life that maybe slows down your plans um, might push you into greater communion with Jesus or actually mean the salvation of another person watching you handle that red light moment with grace and hope. Thank God for red lights. 
These can be painful moments of, of God's grace. And the great preacher said this, I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. James chapter 1 verse 4 says to count all trials as pure joy. As pure joy. Do we see trials as a grace? Church, do we see trials as a grace pushing us into Jesus? Right after my brain surgery, I actually had this amazing time uh, of correspondence with a, with a student who didn't believe in the existence of God, uh, didn't really want to be in relationship with God or be a part of any of that. And he actually doubted the existence of God, not because of moral evil in the world, like I lie to you and you lie to me, and it makes the world a terrible place, like moral evil. He could just be like, that makes sense to me. I can see why the world's a terrible place. But he didn't get things like natural evil, like, why does God, if he's a good God, why does he allow hurricanes and pestilence, famine? Why, why does God allow it? cancer? Why would a good God do this? Why would a good God do this? And I told him, I said, I believe, based on the Bible's teaching, that God is the greatest good in the universe and that knowing him is the very best thing that could happen in our lives. And like everything else in this life, including like temporary physical health and wealth and prosperity, is secondary to knowing the God of the Bible revealed in Jesus. I then continued, and this is an excerpt from the email. <clears throat> How can God get the attention of free creatures with free wills to freely choose him? Let me read that sentence again. How can God get the attention of free creatures with free wills to freely choose him? From my own experience and the experience of others, death can be one of those things that makes us think about how we are living today. What is life all about and why am I here? And other similar questions that aren't often asked when skies are blue. I believe God can use and allow horrific natural and moral tragedies to bring free creatures into freely choosing him the greatest good for our lives. The Bible says that God is love and that no darkness exists in him. Because God is love, he would never force anyone to choose him against their will. But him, knowing that he's the greatest good for humanity, will allow things that we consider terrible to get our attention and to turn our focus onto him, the author of life. God is will allow the removal of lesser goods, those common graces, to point us to the greatest good, the greatest grace, and that's Jesus. And this may not be satisfactory, th this answer, and you know what? I, I don't have all the answers. This is kind of how I look at certain things. You know, it may not satisfy today if you're going in it through a really difficult time. I just want to say I'm sorry, and I just want to cry with you. I understand how life can be rough. And terrible, and even Job asks this question of God. He's like, God, what are you doing? And then God's only response to him is, do you have any idea of what my plans are from beginning to end? Do you even have an ounce of knowledge of what I'm up to? Do you even have any idea? Do you have any idea what I have planned for you and for the world? Once we get it into our heads that this life isn't about us, and it's about Jesus, we will be truly free, and we won't have to live from light to light just like, am I going to be happy today? Am I going to be sad today? Am I going to be happy today? Am I going to be sad today? We'll be truly free when we learn that we exist for God's glory and that no person or circumstance can take that away from you. Do we only praise God through his, for his grace through green lights? I mean, if you're suffering this morning, I want to say there, there is hope, and it's off-world hope. You know, sometimes all the trouble and the pain that we experience in this lifetime doesn't get resolved in this lifetime. Sometimes all we can do is hope for tomorrow, that tomorrow that Jesus is creating for us in eternity. Scripture says that even Jesus suffered and knows what you're feeling. Including, for the Christian, these are, these are some truths. I actually would encourage you to write these down because I've listened to a lot of sermons and I know how they work. And you're like, that was great. And then Monday morning, you're like, what did he say? So... All right, I would like you to write these, these four points down, maybe in your own words, and I'll just give you a chance to find your pen. Or iPhone. If you're, yeah. And, oh. <coughs> For the 
Christian, God's grace and convicting you of sin. Biblical grace, that's forgiveness, says that if you are not displaying it to others, you probably haven't experienced it. It's not possible to experience divine grace and withhold it from others. And being convicted of personal sin is proof that one, the Holy Spirit is in you, and two, that God loves you, and three, his grace is still working in your life. Celebrate that. God's grace in convicting you of sin. Two, give thanks for common grace. Like I said, all of us, we just breathed. We all just took a breath. We all drove here in cars. We're all going home to houses. Thank God for the things that are common to all of us. You know, because people, Christians and non-Christians alike, will, will can, you know, experience these good things but they're not going to experience the fullness of that good thing the way that God has intended it. When you're actually thankful for the giver of what has been given, you you tend to be more thankful for that thing. You're like, God, thank you so much for what you have given me. And that just points you to, to him and to celebrate him and worship him more. Celebrate that. Give thanks for common grace. If you're not in pain today, say thank you, God. If you're in pain today, say, God, help me. Draw me closer to you. Give thanks for common grace. Thirdly, God's grace in giving you what you never deserved. You know, you and I, we demand justice from our enemies. I don't know how many siblings that you had or like, you know, when like toy got stolen. And you go to your folks and you're like, I demand justice. Ah." Probably more whiny than that, but you know, that might have been close. But um, we, we, we want justice for our enemies, but we don't want justice for ourselves. You know, that's crazy. And if you haven't asked God actually for forgiveness for your sins this morning, you know that you're at odds with the creator of the universe and that you're deserving of his justice. To accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior says, I'm going to follow you to the very end. And to accept Jesus as not only your Savior, but your Lord, I'm going to follow you to the very end, is to accept the justice, mercy, and grace that he embodies, not just presents, that he embodies Be gracious to each other. You will offend people, and people will offend you. I'm going to guarantee that. Be gracious to each other. You know, there's like, is there a person out there that just annoys you? Is there? Like, I don't have those because I'm a pastor, but like, like there's there are people out there that just annoy you. You're like, ah, you know. Well, you know what's crazy is there's people out there who are annoyed by you. (laughs) That you just they they're just like I can't stand that David Piper. I, I. Those people exist, and they exist. So be gracious to one another. Be gracious to one another. Fourthly, God's grace to you in the green light and red light moments. We need to say, I didn't deserve that green light. Like, literally, we could have been born in, like, 12th century Mongolia. Like, you could, like, you're like, I went to college, and I worked hard. And I'm like, okay, that's awesome. But you could have been a farmer, a peasant farmer, and no matter how hard you worked, you were going to grow up, you're going to be poor and you might have starved to death and your kids were going to grow up working really hard and probably starving to death. You know, we didn't choose the time and place that we were born into. We didn't choose the families we were born into. We got stuck with those. And, so, and God's grace will help us get through that. <laughs> but to say here is, you know, God, I didn't deserve that green light. You know, I, I'm being faithful in my part with what you have given me. But just saying, well, God, you've given it to me. You have given this to me. I didn't give it to myself. I didn't choose this. And to say thank you, Lord, in the red lights. To say thank you in the red lights. Because every red light experience, I believe, becomes an opportunity for us as the church to publicly display an off-worldly hope that people don't have when they're, all their hopes are in the common graces of this world. They're like, oh, my things are working and my body is moving. I'm, and that's, if that's where their hope lies, that can be taken away. And when you actually say, when those things have been taken away in my life, and I'm still publicly professing Jesus and professing off-worldly hope, That's compelling. That's really compelling. So thank God. You say, God, this moment stinks. I really don't like it, but I'm thankful for this opportunity that's going to draw me closer to you, the greatest good for my life, and might mean the salvation of my neighbors who are watching me every day. Now, I don't want us to over-spiritualize red lights and green lights. I'm just using them as examples, but just track with me here for a second and continuing on with this example the next red light that you get to like actual red light like when you're driving down um you know swim dungeness avenue and you're going on to washington street and it goes red light just say thank you 
like the next red light that you experience, just not in the sense that you're like, oh, I'm thankful for this red light. Just let it remind you that we're, we're to give God praise through those green light moments of life and those red light moments of life that are really hard and are really difficult. And just say it audibly in your car. If you're by yourself, cool. If you're not, the person might be like, that's weird. <laughs> but then it's going to give you an opportunity to be like, yeah, preacher, God told me to say thank you to this red light. Let red lights remind you that God is working through all of it that God is working through all of it, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I want to close with uh, a passage here from Revelation chapter 7. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open those. Revelation chapter 7, verse 14. I just want to read this to you and let these words just wash over you. Um, I actually did the, the read through the Bible in a year, and so this came just a couple days ago, and I was like, that's awesome. Thank you, Lord, for, for just this, and I'm going to put that into the sermon. So here we go. Verse 14, and he said, These are those they who have come out of the great tribulation, the church. And he said, They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them, his protection over them. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them nor any scorching heat, for the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Every tear from their eyes. So it's not lost on me that some people here are probably experiencing a tremendous amount of suffering, and just today's a really rough day, and I don't want to minimize any of that. I just want to say that God is bigger than all of that. Hold on to him. He might be drawing you closer to him to increase your joy and also bring others around you to a saving knowledge of the grace of Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your grace in all things. Lord God, thank you that even when it feels like life is, is falling apart, Lord, that we can count on you, our salvation. Lord, help us to not only praise you when, when things are going well, but when things are not going well. Help us to praise you when um, just things are, are seemingly just falling apart, Lord, because you're going to use it, Lord. You might be drawing us closer to you in those moments, Lord, for the people that are suffering today. You might be drawing them closer to you. Lord, if, if there are folks out there that don't know you this morning, Lord, maybe you're, you're taking some things away that they just relied so heavily on to show them that those things are not things that we can count on. They're not things that we can count on. Lord, I, I just, I'm thankful for what you're doing in our lives. I pray that you would increase our awareness of your grace in all situations and that we would just daily just look to you, Lord, the author of our salvation in whom all hope is found. There's no hope elsewhere. I just pray that this, uh, this year, 2018, we would walk into this year with just anticipation of experiencing more for what, of what you have for us and the good and the bad, Lord. I just pray that um, we would live lives of gospel hope marked by uh, just our saving knowledge of Jesus, Lord, and we would just live out of that and that people would see that and they would say, I want what they're on. I want what they're on. Lord God, just thank you for the people that are here today. You're so good to us, Jesus. Thank you. Amen.